welcome to Dark Knight Films Reviews. I am your host, Matt Spies, and today we are spanning the 1930s to the 1940s Universal Monsters movies. From 1931 all the way to 1946. Beginning with Dracula, released in 1931. Dracula stars Bella Lugosi, Edward Van Sloan, Dwight Fry, Helen Chandler, and David Manners. Dracula was directed by Todd Browning and Carl Freund. Now, most people only consider this film as directed by Todd Browning, but The truth is, Todd Browning was not a very happy person when Dracula was made in 1931. He had just lost his friend, the great Lon Chaney Sr. And he was in a bit of a distressed time in his life. So, on the set of 1931's Dracula. He wasn't the best of people working on it. In fact, there were times when he would just walk off of the set and his cinematographer, Carl Freund, would end up directing full scenes all on his own. Which is why I said this was directed by Todd Browning and Carl Freund. Many of the most iconic moments from Dracula, 1931, were directed by Carl Freund. The famous shot in which Bela Lugosi hypnotizes the flower girl at the beginning when he first arrives in London. That was all Carl Freund. as many of his other iconic moments where Dracula was using his mesmeric powers. Dracula 1931 has a mixed bag of a cast. Bela Lugosi and Edward Van Sloan and Dwight Fry are excellent in their portrayals of their roles in this film. They are the standouts, but it's not all good. As Helen Chandler, David Manners, and many of the other actors are very stilted and very dull in their roles. And the overall production on this film just feels like a stage play being shot for the screen instead of an actual film adapted from the Bram Stoker's classic novel. And there's a reason for that, because of this was based on the stage play and not the actual novel. So, you have great moments with Bela Lugosi and Edward Van Sloan, and those little crazy moments with Dwight Fry's Renfield. But then you have those dull portrayals with Helen Chandler as Mina, and David Manners as Jonathan Harker, and it just really brings the film down and makes it a chore to watch today. Now, the scenes in which Bela Lugosi and Edward Van Sloan share the screen, they command your presence. They are the ones that you are focused on. When that 
is not the case when it's other characters on screen. It is a quite boring film. Sad to note that the film that started a cinematic universe, the first ever cinematic universe that is, today has not aged as well as its contemporaries. So my rating for Dracula 1931 I give this film a 6.0 out of 10. Now, I will move on to my next review. Next up, we are looking at Dracula from 1931. And you might be thinking, but Matt, you just reviewed Dracula 1931. Well, this Dracula from 1931 stars Carlos Valerius, Lupita Tovar, Barry Norton, Pablo Alvarez Rubio, and is directed by George Milford. Now this film was shot on the same sets at night while the Bela Lugosi version was shot on those sets during the day. George Melford did have the advantage of watching the dailies of Bela Lugosi's version earlier in the day. So, he could look at it and he could go, I think I could improve that. I can think I can make that better. And that is exactly what he did with this film. Dracula, the Spanish version, as it is known today, is a much better shot film. Is it better acted? In some respects, it is. In some respects, it is equal to the Bela Lugosi version. But one thing it superior against the Bela Lugosi version is in its visual style and its camera movements and its vibrance. George Melford directs this film as if he was ahead of his time. It feels more like a film from the 40s with the Universal Era, which the filming styles and the acting had progressed from the 30s. And that's what this film feels like. Carlos Valerius is not as good as Bela Lugosi but he gets many more great sequences to do more than what Todd Browning allowed Bela Lugosi to do. So in that respect, his performance gets to shine a little bit better as Lupita Tovar's representative of Mina in this story does the same. She is much more attractive and much more interesting as a character because she plays her with life, vibrance, much different than Helen Chandler did in the Bill Lugosi version. Barry Norton is the same way in the role of Juan Harker, the representation of Jonathan Harker in this film. Pablo Alvarez Rubio, who plays Dwight Fry, is okay. 
he's a little bit more over the top than even Dwight Fry was. And he gets extra scenes to shine as the character. So it is hard to judge on those performances. Now, my final review of Dracula, 1931, the Spanish version. I give this film a 7.8 out of 10. This film was the best of the Dracula movies of this time period. It follows the story in a much better way. It's still following the stage play and not the book by Bram Stoker. But it is a much more lively and a much more exciting portrayal of that story. It doesn't just feel like a stage play being shot. It actually feels like a cinematic achievement. And that is why it gets a higher review from me than the Bela Lugosi version. Next, Frankenstein, released in 1931. Frankenstein stars Colin Clive, Mae Clark, Boris Karloff, John Bowles, Edward Van Sloan, and Dwight Fry. Frankenstein was directed by James Whale. Now, Frankenstein is a big improvement over Dracula, released the same year. James Whale has a completely different style of shooting than what Todd Browning or even Carl Freund had. I would not say that he is up to the standard set by George Melford on his Dracula, but it is a better U.S. production. Colin Clive is such a good actor in his portrayal of Dr. Victor Frankenstein. May Clark, as his love interest, Elizabeth, is attractive, and she acts very well, unlike a lot of the stilted actresses of this time period. She's very believable and very realistic in her portrayal. Boris Karloff, of course, this is the film that made him an icon in film, playing the Frankenstein's monster for the first time in his career. John Bowles is Colin Clive's friend and also competitor for the attention of May Clark's Elizabeth. He does really well in his role as well. In fact, a lot of the performances in Frankenstein 1931, it's not anything like the mixed bag that there was with Dracula in 1931. Um, many of them do much better performances than the previous film did, including the always great Edward Van Sloan and Dwight Fry. This time, Edward Van Sloan is only briefly in the film playing the mentor figure to Colin Clive, who is unfortunately killed when he tries to end the life of the Frankenstein monster. Dwight Fry, in the meantime, is playing the role of Fritz, and Fritz is slightly different than 
Renfield in Look. But it's basically, this is where poor Dwight Fry became typecast, if you will. So, my rating for Frankenstein, 1931. I give this film an 8.0 out of 10. It is the best of the U.S. productions so far. Next we have The Mummy, released in 1932. The Mummy stars Boris Karloff, Zita Johan, David Manners, Arthur Byron, Edward Van Sloan. It is directed by Carl Freund. Now, The Mummy marks a change in Boris Karloff, in which he was actually playing a fully sinister character in here. This character is much more in line with Dracula, and uh, you could have easily seen Bela Lugosi playing this character. The Imhotep mummy character in this. We only see him as a mummy in the opening moments when they find him in his tomb. Then he awakens and walks away. The next time we see him, he looks more in a just a traditional Egyptian garb and looks like a normal person, with the exception of a slight little tinge of makeup on his face to make him look a little aged. The real standout in this film is not only Boris Karloff, but Zita Johan as the love interest. She is very beautiful and she is very exotic in her portrayal of this character. You can believe that an Egyptian character that has been dead for centuries coming back and finding this woman would become obsessed with her. You can completely believe this. But this film does have the same problem that Dracula has in some respects. They bring back David Manners to play a character in this, and of course he is the same stilted and boring performance as he was in the past. Arthur Byron is so-so, it's -so, okay. Edward Van Sloan is excellent as always. This man, I have never seen him on screen ever give a bad performance. So kudos to him for a great career in these films. This film was shot in such a exotic and great manner by Carl Freund that it makes it transcend um, some of the more boring ways of shooting in certain scenes. Carl Freund can go from shooting a flat shot on someone to doing a vibrant camera angle zooming over and down into a pool of water. Very good work there. So, in that respect, I will give it a nearly equal score to Frankenstein. I will give it an 8.0 out of 10. Next we have The Invisible Man, released in 1933. The Invisible Man stars Claude Rains, Gloria Stewart, William Harrigan, and Henry Travers. The Invisible Man is directed by James Wade. This film... James Whale continues his fun and over-the-top 
characterizations that he started with Frankenstein. He ends up making the characters around Claude Rains' Invisible Man so kooky and so fun that you just, you are into this film right from the get-go. Claude Rains is entirely in his element, even though we never really get to see his face in this film, except for one moment near the very end. This man performs under bandages and having his face basically completely erased um, in some scenes that still the special effects in this film are still excellent to this day. What they were able to achieve with these effects on this film, making Claude Rains completely invisible, and you see, like, his hand, you know, him removing a glove and his hand being completely gone. Or removing the bandages from his head and his head is not visible. It's very well done. So, it is a trendsetter and it set up even better effects for future films. It made visual effects, a thing that were second nature for many filmmakers in later films. But in this one, they were the trendsetters. Now, my review of The Invisible Man from 1933. I will give this film an 8.5 out of 10. I really enjoy this film, and I still enjoy watching it to this day. It just, the quirkiness of the characters and the fun that Claude Rains has, even though he is very seldom seen, and his performance is mostly with his vocals, excellently done. Next, we have The Bride of Frankenstein from 1935. The Bride of Frankenstein stars Boris Karloff, Elsa Lanchester, Colin Clive, and Valerie Hobson. Again, this film was directed by the great James Whale. And this is, in my opinion, James Whale's greatest film he ever made. Boris Karloff in this is quite excellent. Elsa Lanchester is excellent, playing the dual roles of Mary Shelley at the very beginning and as the female monster, the Bride of Frankenstein of the title. Colin Clive, as usual, is excellent in his portrayal of Dr. Victor Frankenstein. Valerie Hobson replaces May Clark because of Apparently, some illness that May Clark was suffering, she was unable to reprise her role, unfortunately. But Valerie Hobson is an excellent replacement for May Clark, and she actually feels like a continuation of May Clark's original character from the first film. James Whale comes into his element with this one. This film... Boris Karloff makes his character of the monster even more human in some ways, but at the same time, he makes him sinister in some scenes. Colin Clive comes into full hero mode near the end, and Boris Karloff, his monster, lets him walk away. Now, I will give The Bride of Frankenstein, 1935, a 9.0 out of 10. 
This is the best film so far of the 1930s. And some might say that they will not get any better than this one. Next we have Werewolf of London, released in 1935. Werewolf of London stars Henry Hull, Werner Oland, Valerie Hobson, and Lester Matthews. Werewolf of London is directed by Stuart Walker. Now, I do not know much more about Stuart Walker as a filmmaker, but in this film, um, whether it's the combination of a Greek cast or what, because Henry Hull is excellent in his role of the lead character. Warner Olin playing the villainous werewolf who ends up turning Henry Hull into a werewolf to begin with is excellent as well. He's a little bit more over the top than Henry Hull is. Um, and then we have Valerie Hobson, of course, um, playing the same excellent style role that she played as the love interest um, as she played in The Bride of Frankenstein. Stuart Walker directs this film very well. The transformation scenes, it just basically takes what we had with the Invisible Man, with the effects, and they just step it up even more because the transformations from that Henry Hull does in this film are very believable. Him transforming from man to werewolf. Very good. The effects, the makeup, um, excellent. And the storyline in this one is very unique and interesting. It almost feels like a werewolf movie a little bit of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in it. That's not a bad thing. That's, that's pretty cool. So, my review of Werewolf of London. I give this film a 7.5 out of 10. Very good entry into the Universal Monster series. Not the best, but certainly not too shabby. Yeah. Next we have Dracula's Daughter, released in 1936. Dracula's Daughter stars Otto Kruger, Gloria Holden, Marguerite Churchill, and Edward Van Sloat. Dracula's Daughter was directed by Lambert Hillier. Now, Dracula's daughter is a bit of an oddity in this first cycle of Universal Monster films. It, uh, it, is, it is almost equally as old school style shot as what Dracula 1931 with Bela Lugosi was. There's not much as far as stylistic stuff in this film. Lambert Hilliard directs it as just a standard 1930s film. Nothing really stands out in this film for me with the exception of one performance and that was Edward Van Sloat reprising his role as Van Helsing. He is very underused though in this film and more Edward Van Sloat in this film would have definitely helped 
elevate this film to a better status. Gloria Holden is fine in the leading role, as is Otto Kruger. They are not as bad as David Manners or Helen Chandler, but there is nothing interesting or unique about either one of them in their roles. So, in closing on this one, I will give Dracula's Daughter a 6.0 out of 10. It is not the best of the 1930s, and it is fairly close to the 1931 Dracula with Bela Lugosi. Next we have Son of Frankenstein, released in 1939. Son of Frankenstein stars Boris Karloff, Basil Rathbone, Bela Lugosi, and Lionel Atwill. Son of Frankenstein was directed by Roland V. Lee. Now, Roland V. Lee is another director like Stuart Walker, who I've not seen a lot of his other works. So, I only have Son of Frankenstein to go by, as far as his directing. And, from what I saw in Son of Frankenstein, he is quite the director. This film is very stylistically shot. It is not boring in any way with its performances and the way it is shot. Cinematography is very good in this film. And plus, having a legendary actor like Boris Karloff, Basil Rathbone, Bella Lugosi, and Lionel Atwill all in one film, that is gold, in my opinion. Boris Karloff gives his most sinister portrayal of the monster in this final film of the 1930s. Basil Rathbone is equally as good as what Colin Clive was as Victor Frankenstein playing his supposed son in this story. But Bela Lugosi and Lionel Atwill are the two that really stand out in this. Bela Lugosi playing the role of Igor. And the voice he does in this, it just shows that Bela Lugosi did have talent. He was not just Dracula. He could not just play those kind of characters. So, this is a role that I enjoy him more in, in this role, than I do playing Dracula. You may call that sacrilege, but I call that an excellent performance that I embrace. Lionel Atwill, meanwhile, playing the role where his hand is wooden and he raises it up to shake your hand and everything. This, this character is just excellent. Excellent. Lionel Atwill has always been one of my favorite actors of this time period. And he always gives an excellent performance, much like Edward Van Sloan did. So, my review of Son of Frankenstein, the final film of the 1930s. I give this film an 8.5 out of 10. Great ending to Boris Karloff's Frankenstein series, in my opinion. All right. Now, moving on to the 1940s reviews, we begin with The Invisible Man Returns, released in 1940. The Invisible Man Returns stars Cedric Hardwick, Vincent Price, Nan Gray, John Sutton, and is directed 
by Joe May. Now, The Invisible Man Returns is a really, really good Invisible Man movie. But in comparison to the original James Whale, Claude Rains movie, it is a much more serious tone, and it just does not feel like a follow-up to the off-the-wall and fun Invisible Man by James Whale. Uh, Joe May does do a great job. I mean, this is, this is like I said, this is a more dramatic uh, take on The Invisible Man. Cedric Hardwick is uh, basically our villain of this uh, piece um, in here. And he played that very well in a lot of his films uh, during this time period. Vincent Price is our Invisible Man, and much like Claude Rains' portrayal of the character, he's mostly, they are capitalizing on Vincent Price's distinct kick-ass voice, which is was, was a smart move, but, you know, you never really hardly see Vincent Price just like Claude Rains, except for in the final moments of the film. Nan Gray is beautiful, as Vincent Price's character's love interest in here. She's really good. She always was good in movies that she was in. Uh, John Sutton is, uh, he's pretty good in this. Um, the real standout, just like the original Invisible Man, um, is the special effects. As usual, I mean, the special effects in The Invisible Man Returns, even though it's more of a serious take on the story, the special effects live up to that original movie. So, I will give The Invisible Man Returns a... 7.5 out of 10. It is a really good follow-up to The Invisible Man, if you get past the fact that it's not going to be as quirky and it's not going to be as fun as the original. Next, we have The Mummy's Hand, released in 1940. The Mummy's Hand stars Dick Foran, Peggy Moran, Wallace Ford, George Zuko, Tom Tyler, and is directed by Christy Caban. Now, this director's, his full name is William Christy Caban, and he decided for his on-screen credits to just go by Christy. Odd, but, uh, okay. But I can't argue with his directing. He does a very good job on this Mummy sequel. Even though it's more of a remake of the Imhotep one, and it's a different Mummy in this one, this one we have Karis as our Mummy instead of Imhotep. And Tom Tyler plays Karis pretty good here, considering he was more a cowboy actor and um, was known for playing uh, Captain Marvel in the Adventures of Captain Marvel serial at the time. Um, Dick Foran and Peggy Moran have a really good uh, chemistry as a, as love interests in the story. Uh, Wallace Ford is a good uh, comic relief character in there. And George Zuko as our basic lead villain that is controlling um, 
Tom Tyler's mummy is very good in his performance as well. So not a bad follow-up to the mummy, um, even though it has basically nothing to do with the original film and basically is sort of a remake of it instead of being a direct sequel. But I will give The Mummy's Hand a 8.0 out of 10. It's a damn good mummy movie. Next we have The Invisible Woman, released in 1940. The Invisible Woman stars Virginia Bruce, John Barrymore, John Howard, Charles Ruggles, and Shemp Howard, and is directed by A. Edward Sutherland. Whereas I just said that The Invisible Man Returns was a much more dramatic take on The Invisible Man, The Invisible Woman makes it a full-on, just fun comedy. And I love it. I love The Invisible Woman. I did not know what to think of it when I first watched it. I, th I was thinking, okay, it's just going to be The Invisible Man with a female in it. But the quirky, fun performances of Virginia Bruce, she's just having so much fun with this character she's playing in here. And John Barrymore as the... Uh, kind of mad scientist that uh, uses his little machine to make her invisible in this film. It, it's just to show you how crazy and fun this thing is, I mean, you have freaking Shemp Howard in this thing. A future, well, he was one of the Three Stooges before Curly um, started with the group and uh, eventually went to uh, Columbia. But before he rejoined the group, after Curly uh, had his bad uh, stroke and everything, I mean, he was making stuff like this. He was making John Wayne movies. I mean, he was everywhere. Shemp Howard was big. And having Shemp Howard in a universal monsters movie that is just so much fun and he's so much fun in, in this role playing this little henchman character in here he's just this 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 movie is just su such a fun film and charles ruggles playing the uh manservant if you, if you will um to john howard's uh playboy billionaire playboy character I mean, <laughs> some of the things he gets into in this film is just hilarious. So, I mean, between him and John Barrymore's fun performance as the mad scientist character um, and Shemp being in it, you even had Margaret Hamilton, <laughs> freaking the Wicked Witch of the West herself in this, playing like the landlady to John Barrymore's character. I mean, this 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 movie's just too much fun. Um, so, my review of The Invisible Woman from 1940. I give this film an 8.5 out of 10. I absolutely love this film. I adore this film. This this is just such a fun um, universal film. Um, you may not even want to consider it a monster movie because it's just more of a comedy, but I love it. I embrace it for what it is. <laughs> Next, we have The Wolfman, released in 1941. Wolfman stars Claude Rains, Warren William, Lon Chaney Jr., Ralph Bellamy, Bella Lugosi, Evelyn Ankers, 
and is directed by George Faulkner. Now, this one, I completely adore um, this film as well. I love Lon Chaney Jr.'s performances, Larry Talbot. He is so good in here. It's so funny because most of the other uh, films in the 30s had characters that were supposed to be like British or from England and everything. And, and the Wolfman comes along and you've got Lon Chaney Jr., an American and he's just so fun um, playing his role. I mean, he is, he's serious at the same time, but he has just got so much charisma and so much coolness factor to his character. And uh, it's a shame that the character ends up, you know, getting uh, bit by uh, Bela Lugosi's Bela, the uh, werewolf, and turned into the wolf man. He's cursed to walk the earth as a uh, as a wolf man. But I mean, the performances in this, uh, Ralph Bellamy is pretty good in here, um, playing a character named Colonel Paul Monteford in there. And of course, Ella Van Eyckers is gorgeous and and awesome always in her performance. Um, for whatever reason, uh, Evelyn Eyckers and Lon Chaney. Junior were always in a lot of movies together. I don't know if they maybe had something going on as far as a relationship or what, but uh, it's cool that they were in so many films together. But Wolfman, again, just like uh, Werewolf of London, it has amazing special effects on the transformation scenes from Lon Chaney into the Wolfman. Ironically, <laughs> Bela Lugosi's uh, so-called Wolfman, he turns fully into a wolf when he's supposed to turn into a wolf. Now, we don't see the transformation, but we see a real uh, so-called wolf. It's, it's a dog um, posing as a wolf in, in the uh, scenes. But it works for what it was. Um, but, yeah. And, and as usual, Claude Rains is just what an actor he was. Um, he gives a very charismatic performance playing the father of uh, Lon Chaney Jr. in here. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just funny seeing the father and son standing by each other, you know, I mean, because... Lon Chaney Jr. is this thick six foot five, six foot six uh, monster of a man, and he's standing next to Claude Rains, who is just a normal sized guy, and he looks like a midget compared to uh, <laughs> Lon Chaney. But my review of The Wolfman from 1941, I give this film. A 9.0 out of 10. This film is one of my favorites of all time. And I will defend it to my dying day. It And it ages very well, I think. I think when you watch it today, it has just as big an impact as it had back then. So... All right, next we have Ghost of Frankenstein from 1942. Ghost of Frankenstein stars Cedric Hardwick, Lon Chaney Jr., Bela Lugosi, and Evelyn Akers. Ghost of Frankenstein is directed by Earl C. Kenton. Now, this film continues with the Igor character and he is equally as good in his portrayal of the character in Ghost of Frankenstein as he was in his introduction 
inside of Frankenstein. Cedric Hardwick is playing a descendant of Victor Frankenstein. And uh, he's always good, um, but he, he, uh, he's trying here to play um, the more likable character, whereas before this, you know, you had Colin Clive and you had Basil Rathbone, and both those actors can play a character with, that can act a little crazy in moments and still be a charismatic and lovable character. Cedric Hardwick was more a good actor at playing nasty bastards in films. So having him play in this as a Dr. Frankenstein type, um, it, it is a little bit off-putting in the film. He still does great, um, but it's just so different seeing him play something like that. Um, Lon Chaney Jr. as the Frankenstein monster is... He's not as good as he was at playing the character of Larry Talbot, but he is a fairly suitable um, replacement for Boris Karloff, who chose not to reprise his role and come back, considering that he's little, getting a little too old to be trying to play the Frankenstein monster, apparently. And he probably wanted to just move on to different roles. But, uh, again, Evelyn Anchors is in this, and she's just so beautiful and so so good in her role as well. This time, she can't play the love interest to uh, Lon Chaney Jr., because Lon Chaney Jr. is playing the Frankenstein monster. But a very good sequel to Son of Frankenstein. Good direct follow-up to it, and... Uh, And I didn't mention it before, but you also have uh, Lionel Atwill in this film. Um, he is not playing his same character that he played in um, Son of Frankenstein, unfortunately, though. So that kind of hurts. But Ross C. Canton directs a really good film here. Um, it is well shot, well put together, um, very well written. Um, so... I will give Ghost of Frankenstein from 1942 a 7.5 out of 10. Not the best, not the greatest of the Universal Monster movies, but it's pretty damn good. Next up we have Invisible Agent from 1942. Invisible Agent stars Ilona Massey, John Hall, Peter Lorre, Cedric Hardwick, and is directed by Edwin L. Merritt. Now, this film is kind of like Universal was wanting to do a little bit of a combination of Casablanca with the Invisible Man movies, and uh, kind of trying to make uh, John Hall's character get turned into an Invisible Man and be a hero to face off against um, Nazis and stuff and everything. And it's just, it's just, uh, this whole Invisible Man series is all over the place as far as, you know, you have... The original movie, which is a quirky, fun film, and then you have Invisible Man Returns, which is a serious, dramatic film, and then you get The Invisible Woman, which is totally just a fun comedy, and now you have this, which is basically a, you know, action film. Um, so it is, 
it is a little bit uh it's a great film though i mean it's still uh well shot well put together it's got some really cool sequences the special effects are still great in it for the invisible you know man stuff and everything and uh Got great performances still, too. You know, I mean, you have Peter Lorre as your main villain in this thing. So, I mean, that's something right there. Um, John Hall as your main hero is suitable. He's really does does a pretty good job in here. Um, Lona Massey is, is an attractive actress and everything. And, of course, you got Cedric Hardwick in here playing a role that's more suiting for him as a bad guy. So, um, I will give Invisible Agent, um, from 1942, a 6.9 out of 10. Um, as a Universal Monsters movie, it just goes a little bit to the off-the-wall kind of thing, trying to go all uh Casablanca on us here but still not a bad film next we have The Mummy's Tomb at least in 1942 The Mummy's Tomb stars Lon Chaney Jr. Dick Foran John Hubbard Elise Knox George Zuko and Wallace Ford the Mummy's Tomb is directed by Harold Young. Now, the Mummy's Tomb is a direct continuation of the Mummy's Hand, unlike the Mummy as opposed to the Mummy's Hand. Um, they directly follow the events in the Mummy's Hand in this film. And this time we get Lon Chaney Jr., taking over and becoming the mummy, playing the role of Karis. And he is so good. I mean, Tom Tyler wasn't shabby as the mummy in the mummy's hand, but uh, to me, there's two roles that Lon Chaney excelled at, and that was as Larry Talbot slash the Wolfman, and is the mummy. He makes a very imposing, very badass mummy. And considering the fact that the mummy's hand was more comical in spots with the Wallace Ford character um, and the quirky little romance between uh, Dick Foran and Peggy Moran, um, this one uh, kind of steps it up and makes it more dramatic. And in fact, I mean, within the first, like, um, 20 minutes of the movie, they have already killed off not only our main hero from the first film, Dick Foran, but then a few minutes later, they end up killing off Wallace Ford as well. Peggy Moran did not return for this film, so uh, they just explained that she... Uh, died in between the two films, apparently. Um, her character did, at least. Um, so the rest of the movie follows uh, John Hubbard, who plays uh, Dick Varan's son in here. Um, his love interest is Elise Knox, and she's 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 cute. She does a good job acting in it. Like I said, these 40s movies, the acting is a lot better than the acting was in a lot of those 1930s movies. So, um, and then we have George Zuko returning as the, uh, the main man that is responsible for bringing um, the monster, the mummy, um, back. Great uh, follow-up to The Mummy's Hand. And uh, my rating on this film, I give this one a 8.5 out of 10. It's a great mummy movie. Excellent. Well done.
Next up, we have Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman from 1943. Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman stars Lon Chaney Jr., Ilona Massey, Patrick Knowles, Bella Lugosi, and Lionel Atwill. Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman was directed by Roy William Neal. Now, this one, it has continuity issues because it's supposed to be directly following um, Ghost of Frankenstein and Frankenstein's uh, monster as played by Bella Lugosi in this one. Um, he's supposed to be blind, yes, which he acts like that, but he's also supposed to be able to talk because he's, it's freaking Igor, which made perfect sense casting Bela Lugosi as freaking the Frankenstein monster, because at the end of the last movie, he had his brain transplanted into him, and he was talking in Igor's voice, you know, so, I mean, this one, <laughs> it just starts up and uh, apparently, somewhere in the making of the film, they, they did a screening after they finished it. And they had him actually talking with uh, the Igor voice, but uh, dumbass people that they screened the movie to said they thought it was comical and stupid, him talking like that. Well, it makes sense with the previous freaking story. What are you complaining about, stupid asses? And instead of being smart and just saying, screw that, let's just release it, you know, um, they ended up just cutting all of Bela Lugosi's dialogue, apparently, um, which I think hurts this overall film. Now, yes, the final battle between um, the Wolfman and Frankenstein is pretty fun and pretty cool and all, but... Um, uh, this one really suffers. And once again, we have Lionel Atwell coming back in here, and he's being wasted. He's not playing the same character he played in the... Uh, well, thankfully, he's not playing the same character he played in uh, Ghost of Frankenstein either, but I mean... I don't know why each one of these Frankenstein films decided to bring Lionel Atwell in but not just have him reprise his role playing that awesome character that he played in Son of Frankenstein. But he didn't. He never got to reprise that role, unfortunately. Um, but Lon Chaney Jr., as always, was great getting to play um, Larry Talbot. It just, it just pains me because I love... You've seen my review of The Wolfman. I love The Wolfman. It just pains me that that movie never got its own, you know, sequels, just follow-ups without um, having other uh, characters thrown in there, like the Frankenstein monster and stuff. But uh, overall, this 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 movie's just so so, just because of the fact that they they. Uh, studio interference due to stupid screenings. So, um, my review of Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, I give this one a 6.5 out of 10. Should have been a knock out of the park, man. Easy, easy victory, but they screwed it up, unfortunately. Next, we have Phantom of the Opera, released in 1943. Phantom of the Opera stars Nelson Eddy, Susanna Foster, Claude Rains, and Edgar Barrier. Phantom of the Opera is directed by Arthur Lubin. Phantom of the Opera, 1943, was the first Universal Monsters movie 
to be released in Technicolor. Now, I'm not much for musicals. I don't really care for musicals. So the fact that um, this one has Nelson Eddy and Suzanne Foster, which was basically, you know, two uh, um, singers at the time playing these roles and, and singing to each other throughout this Phantom of the Opera movie. Um, but since it is Phantom of the Opera, you have to go into a Phantom of the Opera movie and expect that kind of thing because it is about an opera house. So you're going to have characters singing in it. So I've learned to live with that a bit. And uh, this is one of the better um, Phantom of the Opera movies. Blood Rains is one part um, sinister in his portrayal, but at the same time, he makes you actually like him. Um, he makes himself likable. Um, so, I mean, it's not... Nelson Eddy and Susanna Foster are uh, singers first and foremost. They're not the best of uh, actors, and that, you know. But I have to give them credit. They're better than some of those actors from the 1930s, such as uh, Helen Chandler and David Manners. So, um, yeah. Um, Arthur Lubin did a pretty good uh, remake of the Lon Chaney classic silent film, The Phantom of the Opera, with this one. I would give The Phantom of the Opera 1943. I would give this film a 7.0 out of 10. It's uh, one of the better Phantom of the Opera movies. So, now we move on to Son of Dracula, released in 1943. Son of Dracula stars Lon Chaney Jr., Robert Page, J. Edward Bromberg, Louise Albritton, Evelyn Ankers, and is directed by Robert Soitmeg. Now, this film, just because the title is Son of Dracula, Lon Chaney Jr. is not playing the Son of Dracula. He is playing Count Dracula. He is going by the name Alucard, but he is Dracula, but he's just using that name to keep the vampire hunters off of his trail. But it doesn't work very good as uh, Professor Laszlo, played by J. Edward Bromberg. He figures this out pretty quick in this thing. The character of Professor Laszlo is a pretty good uh, representation for Van Helsing in here. We have the new effect that we've never seen done before. And of course, just like the effects on the Invisible Man and the effects we've seen in the transformations with the Wolf Man and Werewolf of London in the past and everything... Um, the effects are getting really good and the effects in this for the smoke coming up through the door, which we've never seen Dracula ever do that before in any other film prior to this, um, very unique and good, um, effect. It works so well in this, but, uh, Lon Chaney Jr. does not work very well as Dracula. I mean, he has the imposing presence because he's a big guy. Um, but him trying to be this suave and debonair vampire, it just doesn't work with him. He's better at playing the everyday man or 
the mummy. Um, so I give him credit for trying to play this part. And for the first time, you know, uh, since, you know, since uh, Ghost of Frankenstein, Alan Cheney Jr. is in a film with Evelyn Ankers, and they are not a couple in it. He doesn't even pursue her like that. The girl he pursues is Louise Saul Britton, um, who is already engaged to be married to Robert Page's character. So it causes a little bit of a love triangle in this film where uh, Louise Saul Britton is leaving her fiancé to be with Lon Chaney Jr. as Dracula. Um, Robert Swedmake does a really good job with the mood, you know, the atmosphere in this, and some of the uh, really unique camera shots that he does in here. But overall, uh, this isn't the best Dracula movie. I would give Son of Dracula a seven point zero out of ten. It is it's got the mood, it's got the atmosphere, it's got attractive uh females in Louis Saul Britton and Evelyn Anchors, which Another bad thing about this is Evelyn Anchors is in a vampire film and never once does uh, Lon Chaney Jr.'s Dracula ever go after her and try to use her. It's, what a w wasted opportunity that was, you know. So, yeah, it's 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 serviceable as a, as a Dracula movie, but not one of the best. Next we have... The Invisible Man's Revenge, released in 1944. The Invisible Man's Revenge stars John Hall, Evelyn Ankers, Alan Curtis, Leon Errol, and is directed by Ford Beebe. Now, following the Casablanca-ish invisible agent. This is not what you were expecting to see in the next step in this film series. This, like I said, this film series has been all over the place. You know, you get the first movie, which is quirky, fun film, and then you get the second one, The Invisible Man Returns, which is more dramatic. And then you get The Invisible Woman, and, you know, it is a comedy, first and foremost. And then you get The Invisible Agent, which is like an action film. And now, The Invisible Man's Revenge, it reverts back to that dramatic film. And John Hall, who was pretty cool playing like the secret agent version of The Invisible Man in... The Invisible Agent is playing like the other Invisible Man and Invisible Man Returns more than any of the previous films. Um, and it's just, it's just strange to see him go from playing this character who the invisibility serum did not make him go insane. It didn't make him bad. It didn't affect him the way it did in The Invisible Man and The Invisible Man Returns, where it makes them go kind of crazy. John Hall's character of Robert Griffin is a completely sinister character even before he is made invisible. So it's funny that this now reverts back to that kind of a story. And, uh, but, I mean, it's got a great co-star in uh, Evelyn Anchors in here. Um... And it's not bad. I mean, it's just, it's weird how they keep changing the uh, storyline. 
Another actress in this film is Gail Sondergaard, who had played in Road to Rio with Bing Crosby and Bob Hope. She plays Evelyn Anker's mother character of Irene in this and sets up John Hall's Robert Griffin's revenge plot. Even though I didn't mention him on the cast, John Carradine plays the character of Dr. Drury, who's responsible for making John Hall invisible. They don't do any kind of continuity at all. Each film is its own little thing and its own little, it's got its own little charm and vibe to it. And, uh, uh, this one's not bad, and uh, it's it's just it's just weird seeing John Hall go from being the uh, charismatic and fun you know agent character in Invisible Agent, and and now he's more um, sinister and wanting you know revenge and everything in here. The only character in this or part of this that even feels like the original Invisible Man is Leon Errol's character. Of Herbert. He feels like he could have been in that and had me genuinely chuckling a couple of times at things he did in this film. But it's well directed, well put together, it's well acted. So I would give The Invisible Man's Revenge a 7.8. Out of ten. It's not a bad uh, addition in the series. In fact, the Invisible Man series is probably one of the better um, series as far as overall good storylines. There wasn't really any weird bad ones in here in this one, unlike the Dracula um, films. So, yeah. And next we have The Mummy's Ghost, released in 1944. Mummy's Ghost stars Lon Chaney Jr., John Carradine, Robert Lowry, Ramsey Ames, and is directed by Reginald LeBorg. Now this one, this film, I mean, the, the plot line with Karis being resurrected once again, and John Carradine playing this Egyptian character who ends up falling in love with Ramsey Ames' character and wants to make her his own, which pisses off Karis and... Um, with Lon Chaney Jr. playing Karis, you don't want to piss that mummy off. And the ending to this thing is so good. Because it's something you don't expect to see. You don't expect the mummy to ever win. I mean, you expect the mummy to be brought down by the end of the film, just like all of the other films. Every film in this series has brought the mummy down in the end. This one broke that mold. The mummy literally takes Ramsey Ames and takes her into the bayou and wins. He gets what he wants. He gets his girl. It's it's the kind of an ending that just shocks you. Your first time I watched this, I was I was in awe of that. I was like, wow, I can't believe they went there. So it is a very well written, well acted mummy movie. So my review for this one, I am going to give it a 
out of 10. This, this to me is the best mummy film Universal ever brought out. Um, and I know some people might call that sacrilege, you know, saying that it's better than the uh, Boris Karloff original. But to me, the Boris Karloff original was not really a uh, mummy style film. I mean, it was more of a, like a Dracula uh, style film. It, it, it didn't, it only felt like a mummy movie at the very beginning. This one, it is a mummy movie where the mummy wins. And that is a win for me. Now, next we have House of Frankenstein, released in 1944. House of Frankenstein stars Boris Karloff, Lon Chaney Jr., J. Carroll Nash, John Carradine, and Glenn Strange. House of Frankenstein was directed by Earl C. Kenton. Now, this is the moment where you got the return of Boris Karloff to the Frankenstein franchise. However, he's playing a mad scientist and not playing the monster himself. So he's basically playing a variation on the Dr. Frankenstein character in this. And uh, he plays it really well. I mean, he's, he's good, and as is J. J. Carroll Nash as the hunchback assistant to him. He's very sinister and very good. And as usual, I mean, you got Lon Chaney Jr. reprising his role as Larry Talbot slash the Wolfman. The big drawback in this film is uh, John Carradine as Dracula. Now, don't get me wrong here. John Carradine could have been playing a really good Dracula. I mean, he's got the charisma as an actor. He's got the style. He's got the right vibes for it. But it just... It sucks that he is featured in the film in the few little moments that he gets at the beginning when he's hypnotizing the one girl that he meets. And he looks like he's going to win the day and he's going to get the girl. And then, of course, you know, her boyfriend comes along, just ends it. And this is whole, th this whole thing happens in the first, like, 20 minutes of the movie. And then Dracula's gone. And then we're just following Boris Karloff, J. Carroll Nash, and his pursuit of trying to revive Glenn Strange's Frankenstein monster. And Lon Chaney Jr. ends up becoming the uh, hero in the end um, for this one, which makes sense because uh, Larry Talbot is a great character. So, but it, yeah, it's just, it, you never really ever see John Carradine's Dracula ever interacting with the Wolfman or Frankenstein's monster. So this whole team up thing, it's just, it's wasted in this film because your main, your main, uh, one of your main players, Dracula, is just, dispatched right at the beginning of the film. So yeah, House of Frankenstein, I give this film a 5.5 5 out of 10. Definitely not the best of the Frankenstein movies. And it's unfortunate because, I mean, Boris Karloff came back and he gave his all in a little performance that he gave in this and, and was good enough, but yeah. Next, we have The Mummy's Curse, released in 1944. The Mummy's Curse stars Lon Chaney Jr., Peter Coe, Virginia Christie, Kay Harding. And it's directed by Leslie Goodwins. Now, this film 
picks up right where the mummy's ghost left off. And it does not do a very... It's, it's a good movie still, but ruining that win that Lon Chaney Jr.'s mummy had in The Mummy's Ghost is not a very good idea. And I like Virginia Christine as in, in this film, but she is not as good as Ramsey Ames was in this role. She does her best with it. She's still attractive. I mean, she... But it's it's uh, it's disappointing that they went in this route with the uh, story. Um, Peter Coe is good in his role. He's you know he's he's serviceable. Um, Kay Harding is like. There's no real reason for her to be there. I mean, the when you have these two clashing uh, females in the story fighting for screen time, the Virginia Christine character has already been an established character, even though she's a different actress playing her. She's going to get more of your attention, and that's the way it was for me. I mean, the Kay, Kay Harding is a good little actress, but... Uh, Nothing. She does nothing in this film that that warrants her even being there. Um, but yeah, it uh, it was a bit of a step down from uh, the Mummy's Ghost. Unfortunately, I will give the Mummy's Curse an eight point zero. Out of ten, it's it's a it's a good film, but it is following the strongest mummy film in my opinion, and that is a hard thing to follow. So, yeah, it it doesn't quite hit hit it out of the park, unfortunately. And next we have House of Dracula, released in 1945. House of Dracula stars Onslow Stevens, John Carradine, Lon Chaney Jr., Martha Driscoll, and Glenn Strange. And again, it was directed by Earl C. Kenton. Uh, Earl, you didn't learn your lesson. Yeah. Same mistakes that were made with House of Frankenstein are made in House of Dracula. John Carradine, he could have been a great, charismatic, awesome version of this character. He's got the talent. But again, they kill him off in like the first 25 minutes of the film only to replace him with Onslow Stevens who has the blood transferred from their some blood transfusion thing where Dracula caused his blood to go into Onslow Stevens and now he's in like a mad scientist now all of a sudden and it's just this is not what we wanted. We didn't need that. We wanted to see Dracula face the Wolfman and face Frankenstein's monster. If you're going to do these clashes where they're fighting, at least as bad as Frankenstein meets the Wolfman was because of the mistakes that they made when they cut out all of Bela Lugosi's dialogue and, you know, really kind of hampered that film. At least it had that big moment at the end where Frankenstein's monster fights. 
the Wolfman. This, you get a little bit of, you know, a little bit of a Lon Chaney Jr., um, Larry Talbot with the Frankenstein monster action in here, but it's not anything to write home about. Um, because at this point, he's been cured of the lycanthropy, so he's not a wolfman anymore. He's just a regular hero trying to fight against uh, the Frankenstein monster. So, yeah, it's... Uh, my review of House of Dracula. I give this one 6.0 out of 10. Um, slightly better because you have a little bit more of a story with uh, um, Lon Chaney Jr.'s Larry Talbot where he finally is cured, but that's its only saving grace in this film, unfortunately. Next we have She-Wolf of London, released in 1946. She-Wolf of London stars Don Porter, June Lockhart, Sarah Harden, Jane Wiley, and is directed by Gene Yarbrough. Now, Whereas I really appreciated the difference in vibe with Invisible Woman, this one, it just tries to, it just, it's just a murder mystery is basically what it is. And it tries to trick you into believing that one character in it, June Lockhart, is a female werewolf in this. But it's revealed that it's all in her mind. None of it is real. None of that is real. Um, so it's, it's, just, it's just a weird little murder mystery kind of a film instead of being a horror. Now this might have worked it being this murder mystery thing. It had... June Lockhart's character actually been like a werewolf. Because this could have been as good as Werewolf of London was. But as a female, you know. Or even if they would have went, you know, full on, you know, kind of comedy the way that um, Invisible Woman did. It could have been fun. It's not any of those things. This is overly dramatic. It is weird in its imagery of these visions and these dreams that June Lockhart's having of her supposedly turning into a, a werewolf, which is fake. It's not real. So, yeah. Um, this is definitely not a good way for Universal to have ended the 1940s in their Universal Monsters line. Um, I give this film a 5.8 out of 10. Um, the acting in it is fine. June Lockhart's fine, but it just sucks that she's not actually a where I hate I hate fake out um, storylines like that where it doesn't give you what you're wanting, you know. So give me light, give me color. That's better. Now, what do you think? Do you uh, agree with my ratings of? all of these reviews that I've done in this issue. 
Let me know in the comments down below. What do you think? And, as usual, do not forget to like, share, and subscribe. Because it really does help my channel out a lot. And uh, I've also got a few more um, reviews from the Universal Monsters. But this ends the 30s and the 40s. We are done with that. So, hope you've enjoyed this. And thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.